shooter games. Possibly the most popular way to interact with the digital world in the early 2020s is by tossing bullets towards others, especially in an online multiplayer setting. While things certainly started out differently, in today's gaming world, the most popular entries tend to opt for a current era or near future setting. And I've always had a problem with this type of game. Well, not a problem necessarily, but a bit of an inconsistency that I found, and it has to do with the way that PMCs, or private soldiers, are portrayed in video games these days. PMCs, or private military contractors, have started to pop up all over gaming media, TV shows, and films, and, well, they've been popping up in our news feeds too. Art is, of course, a reflection of reality, as I'm sure that we've all heard before. But the way that games media has been reflecting reality, how it's been portraying these soldiers of fortune, it isn't quite on the money. In most films, TV shows, or games media, PMCs are portrayed as essentially soldiers, warfighters, guys with guns, who, rather than working for a country or an army, work for a company. But they're often basically right alongside the good guys, helping them with whatever cause, or right alongside the bad guys, doing essentially the same. Well, in reality, there's a lot more going on than that, and the situation that PMCs find themselves in in real life, as well as the entire geopolitical reality of the private military world, is almost nothing like how we've come to see it in games media. No one has ever really taken the care to create a game which really details, even remotely realistically, what PMCs really do and why. Well, there is a game that is trying to do exactly that, and it is not only taking inspiration and guidance from real PMCs, but doing so while also talking about the changing face of modern warfare, and how it is, in reality, almost nothing like the games which title themselves as such. And no, it's not Escape from Tarkov. So yes, PMCs have of course been represented a number of times in modern games media. The first example that I personally remember was Call of Duty 11 Advanced Warfare, set in the near future it centers around Atlas, a private military corporation described as essentially having become a privatized world military power due to its reach, influence, and ahead of the curve R&D. We are a superpower for hire. More recent Call of Duty titles have also contained references to private militaries, such as Connie Group and Shadow Company. However, I do think the popularization of PMCs in modern gaming really came from the title Escape from Tarkov. Well, many pieces of fiction, games, media, or otherwise throughout the 1990s to 2000s have made consistent references to mercenaries, mercs, or private armies, Escape from Tarkov made a uniquely concerted effort to portray private military contractors in a more realistic manner. Rather than simply mercenaries, hired guns, or generic bad guys, PMCs in Tarkov work for one of two companies, Bear or USEC, each with its own political affiliations. However, while the lore and story of Escape from Tarkov describes a believable and intriguing scenario, one which fits perfectly for its gameplay loop, it doesn't actually do a good job of portraying what PMCs operating in the real world face on a daily basis, or why they are so important to the changing face of modern warfare. There is a game that intends to talk about exactly this, not through a story or narrative exactly, but through its core design philosophy and background. That game is upcoming Grey Zone Warfare, developed by Czech studio Madfinger Games and heading for early access on Steam this spring quarter of 2024. You may have heard me discuss Grey Zone's DNA. Firstly, the book Roadside Picnic, the 1972 science fiction novel from which the film Stalker and game series Stalker is also based. What you will not have heard me discuss is how the game draws equal inspiration from the real-world conflicts of today, and the evolving ways in which the private sector and PMCs have become intertwined with these conflicts. While the developers are, of course, doing extensive research from experts with their portrayal of firearms, military gear, as well as the aesthetics and culture of the location that the game is inspired by, they're also working with and being advised by someone intimately involved with and knowledgeable about PMCs, an ex-PMC, by the name of Sean McFate. McFate, in his own words, went to the dark side and became a private military contractor after years of service as a U.S. Army paratrooper. First working for a security contractor on U.S. government contracts, he went freelance and worked all over the globe for many years, advising and taking part in operations for various clients. According to McFate, it became clear after a few years that this was a young man's game. And having also witnessed some disturbing things, he retired from the business to reflect on and really analyze to pull away the veil from the modern reality of not only the private military sector, but the face of of warfare as it really exists today. It was through this work and the fiction and non-fiction works of literature that resulted from it that he came in contact with Mara, the lead developer and creative director at Madfinger Games. Through talking with McFate, a concept rose to the forefront, the one which eventually lent itself to the name of the game Madfinger is now developing. Military and geopolitical strategists have this concept, the twilight between peacetime and wartime, a space not held by standing armies, but covert groups, operations by the likes of Delta, SEALs, or SOCOM. Oftentimes this twilight requires tactics and actions besides direct military operations. 
situations. It's a delicate balance where creativity is especially required and moral, ethically challenging situations often arise. Rather than tanks, jets, submarines, missiles, or artillery, these are situations where small teams of highly trained, educated, creative, entrepreneurial, lethal individuals will insert themselves, quietly under the radar, to conduct covert operations outside the eyes of news media or the public. This twilight area between black and white of war and peace is known by military strategists as gray zone warfare. Now, like I mentioned, there are many covert operations conducted by representatives of nations or standing militaries all the time. Think of the raid on Osama bin Laden, for example. But as McFate describes, there are, as you know, public military forces like the Green Berets, for example, the US Army Special Forces. So what happens when a Green Beret stops being a Green Beret and starts working in the private sector, taking all of that knowledge and skill with him? Well, this is exactly what's happened all over the world. This reality of gray zone warfare is entering the private space, and the ways in which war is being waged is changing rapidly in interesting and potentially very concerning ways. Gray Zone Warfare, the game, I'll refer to it as GZW from now on to try and curb any confusion, it's attempting to reveal in as realistic a light as possible the world of people involved in PMCs, what they're doing, and why. So let's talk about that for a moment. Why are PMCs doing what they're doing across the world? Well, at the end of the day, it comes down to, you guessed it, money. But it is a little bit more complicated than that. McFate in this interview is asked the question, is there actually a difference between a PMC and a mercenary, a gun for hire? I don't think there's a, any difference. I mean, there's been lots of experts who are trying to explain that there is some sort of difference, but... Essentially, he says, that line is blurry, and whether someone is on one side or the other really has only to do with that individual's personal decisions and their own moral compass. As somebody who's coming from that world, the line between a private military contractor and a mercenary is blurry, because if you have the skill set to do one, then you can easily do the other. It depends on the market circumstances and the will of the individual, and that's it. The market, by the way, is is expanding and rapidly across the world. Household names like Blackwater, or more recently Wagner Group, may come to mind for many. That's for one simple reason. Both companies were on government contracts in very public-facing wars fought by major world powers, and both were steeped in controversy because of their actions in these very public conflicts. These PMCs with bad press are often the inspiration for PMCs in games media. Meriwether in Grand Theft Auto, for example, is a clear parody of Academy, formerly known as Blackwater, and Kony Group in the current Call of Duty Modern Warfare franchise bears a similar black and red logo to Russia. And PMC Wagner. But in reality, most PMCs in the world are operating on private contracts in sectors that most people may never have even an inkling of awareness of. Hired by oil or mining operations, billionaires, Fortune 500 companies, or as military strategists or training experts in proxy conflicts, PMCs are working all over the world all the time. And they're making a lot of money doing it. Sean McFate, upon leaving the US military, was contracted by a private military company who wanted his help raising a small army in Africa. After negotiating with the contractor, McFate says he was paid just over twice his ranked salary in the US Army. We're getting to the, the point where anybody who has enough money can swipe a check and rent a private army, rent a special operations force. They could wage war for any reason they want, no matter how petty or how weird. McFate describes the state of modern warfare as almost a return to the the reality of medieval conflict. Rather than standing armies representing countries or governing bodies, war is being waged by mercenaries, hired by aristocrats, families, popes, and business magnates. PMCs are in many cases tasked with the retrieval of something, protecting or transporting an asset, achieving some specific task, and when they return to their client, they do whatever they may with those results. For a payment, of course. The private military economy McFate describes is an illicit one, one that operates not unlike narco gangs, mafias, or crime syndicates. They're extremely international organizations, teams of PMCs on a specific operation could be comprised of individuals from all over the world, almost always from a military background and an elite one at that. It's a private space, one which individuals on the outside do not seek out, but are rather invited in. It's a space wrought with fraud, contractors and clients lying left and right about their backgrounds or achievements in order to gain advantages, respect, or better positions. This might be, in part, one of the reasons that you don't see many portrayals of PMCs to a realistic degree in modern media. The world of private militaries is a very confusing one. The groups that we do often see portrayed in one side or another of a conflict are armies, representing a national identity and a certain set of moral or political principles 
principles, or say, freedom fighters or guerrilla groups, representing often a national identity and a certain set of moral or political principles. Military contractors exist almost universally without moral principle as their primary purpose for action. They don't fight, guard, or transport for a flag, a uniform, a nation, a people, or a core fundamental idea or cause. Their cause is business. Money. It's a morally completely gray space, and that's a confusing thing when you're talking about story or narrative-driven content like a film or TV show. There's no good or evil when it comes to PMCs. It is, however, almost the perfect setting to develop a multiplayer video game around. The extraction shooter subgenre was born of settings requiring PMCs. That cash incentive makes sense in the context of a game, especially one revolving around exploration, looting, or asset capture. In the game The Division, players explore a post-apocalyptic New York City, fighting over mercenaries for their looted gear and supplies. Hunt Showdown, albeit a fantasy period setting, revolves around bounty hunters, not entirely unlike private security contractors, who hunt for an asset, a bounty, and return it for profit. In Escape from Tarkov, PMC operatives are cut off from their commands and scavenge for food, supplies, and equipment to help them continue to survive in the cordoned city of Tarkov, working for regional dealers in exchange for gear and, you guessed it, money. While these are intriguing fictional scenarios, nothing in any of these situations has ever quite played out in real life. Even if it did, the question of why professional soldiers in a combat zone would actively choose to kill each other arises. Evidence from real-life disasters tells us that people, for the most part, time and time again, will help each other in whatever way that they can rather than resort to violence, and unless you're literally an assassin, anyone in a conflict zone would likely want to avoid bloodshed, if at all possible. This brings us back to the portrayal of private military contractors in GZW, the game. The PMCs in Lamong Island in GZW are not cut off from command. They aren't stuck in a post-apocalypse. In the lore and story of GZW, the UN has set up an exclusion zone around part of this nation, Lamong, after a mysterious disastrous event caused the civilian population to be evacuated. While the UN and international community have collectively agreed not to set foot within this zone to avoid international conflict, the private sector immediately pounced, with overseas clients hiring these PMCs to investigate the region and bring back whatever they could find. If you want a more in-depth breakdown of not only the game's story, but what we know of its core design, I have two videos on my channel that explain those things respectively. But the point is, PMC operators in GZW have been hired by one of three companies to explore an area, answer some questions, bring back what they find, and they'll be rewarded for doing so. So, coming back to real life, what happens then when two private military companies come in contact with each other in the field? Well, according to McFate, if it's a surprise, things can go sideways quickly. So, I mean, it's one thing if you know that you're in the same area of operation, you might yeah. try to coordinate just to say, hey, this is our turf, this is your turf. When they see each other, they, they can could be an impromptu firefight. If the two companies are aware of each other, they can try and demarcate territory. But coming back to the criminal organization analogy from earlier, this doesn't always go smoothly or cleanly. PMCs can be in pseudo-agreement in their efforts to not get in each other's way, but unexpected things can always happen. Sometimes, in fact, the same client will hire two PMCs for similar tasks without telling either contractor that they've done this. In certain cases, two PMC groups may be on the same side, so to speak, without exactly knowing it. So anytime two PMCs come in contact in the wild, concerns of fratricide or blue-on-blue -blue fire are at the front of everybody's mind. Being part of a private military company isn't like working for an army. Just because two PMCs come in contact with each other does not mean that they will need to engage each other. Sometimes the right decision will be to simply let the other group go about its business, or even to work together to achieve a collective goal. On the flip side, if lines are not carefully drawn, PMCs may decide to engage each other, if it seems beneficial at that time. So this has all been an overview of what Grey Zone Warfare is as a concept and how the expansion of war into the private sector has changed the face of modern conflict for better or worse. But how exactly is the game GZW attempting to go about portraying these themes through gameplay specifically? In the game, the three PMCs are stationed across the island from one another, and individual squads within these will all have similar mission objectives. There will be a significant amount of AI in the final version of the game, and the map will be quite large, 42 square kilometers. That's around the size of the Far Cry 3 map for reference. The game will also not have match or raid instances. When you join a server, you will be joining a persistent world. All of this is to say that you may not run into another PMC group for very extended periods of time, 
time in GCW. If you do, there will be proximity chat, meaning that you'll be able to communicate with that individual or squad. Whether you engage or not, that'll be up to the individual, their circumstances, their goals, and their, well, morality. There will be situations in which it will be beneficial to engage enemy players for a risk that they may engage you. In other cases, it will certainly be beneficial not to engage. One thing is for sure though, the game itself will never outright ask you to draw the blood of another PMC. The contractor companies on Le Mans are, unlike in games like Escape from Tarkov, not in outright opposition to one another. There will be no missions or gameplay elements which require you to kill other PMCs at all. That's the sandbox gameplay element that Madfinger Games is going for. Similarly to in real life, whether you're strictly a contractor doing your job unraveling the mystery of Le Mans Island, or whether you're someone killing whatever's in your path, that depends on who you are as a person, who you surround yourself with, and where your path has taken you. Now, you could say that none of this really matters, that the game should just focus on fun or functionality first. Who really cares about all this background detail if the game doesn't work well around core-designed gameplay systems? And yes, of course, I would for the most part agree with you, but a well-crafted game world, one which feels thoughtful and does a good job of selling its reality to the player, that matters more than you'd think when it comes to getting someone like me invested in a game as large and ambitious as what GCW seems to be going for. Madfinger have said that they are interested in creating an immersive world with a mature story, one which deals with, of course, the ideas that I presented throughout this video. For a hardcore game like GCW, that matters a lot. I think personally, the further that they can take this world building, the believability and intrigue of the quests, the environmental storytelling, really letting you fill the shoes of your PMC in a way that feels meaningful, letting you really play that role. That is what will make that moment-to-moment -moment gameplay feel like it has consequences, like every move that you make really does matter. And well, that is the tagline of the game. We'll see what MFG can pull off. Thanks for watching. Listening to this interview with Sean McFate was really the thing which sparked my major interest in the game. I don't know why, but I've been seeing games for so long draw upon modern conflict in a purely aesthetic sense, making cool looking army guys with cool guns, blah blah blah, without putting even a modicum of thought into how modern conflict actually plays out, why people would choose violence in these scenarios, etc. I want to make a pretty serious point here. War and conflict are not a matter to take lightly. Real life armed conflict is not something that I think should be talked about as entertainment value, to be made light of in any way, joked about or discussed without serious thought for the human reality of it. I don't wish to say that I think games media needs to take direct inspiration from real war to be good or fun. War is not good, fun, or cool in any way. I used imagery and examples from real life war scenarios, and if those were disturbing to bring to mind, I do apologize for that. I do, however, think that all art is a way for people to interpret and reflect the world around us, and in the same way that horror media can pull upon our primal fears to be effective entertainment, interactive media like video games can use this subject matter to bring across a specific point, point an audience toward a specific feeling, and how they take inspiration from real life events can make them more or less effective as works of art. The game is going to be a shooter at its core, of course, and obviously there should always be a healthy separation from reality in this kind of content. But the fact that they're drawing such heavy inspiration from people who actually have experience in this sector really interests me and gives me a lot more faith that there's more going on with this game than your average go here, kill guys, and leave gameplay loop. You'll be hearing more about GZW from me very soon, as I've been chatting with the developers on and off since the game was revealed. Hopefully, it's not much longer until we see real full-on gameplay and get our hands on it ourselves. Until then, hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you very soon. Cheers.